good morning to each and every one of you. If everybody finds your place, we'll get started. Uh, if you have your music sheet that uh, they have over on the table, we're going to be uh, singing hymn number 44. And can it be? Please stand as we sing. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. I want to welcome all of you for being here in our outdoor services. So nice today, isn't it? <laughs> what a beautiful day it is. The Lord has given to us. We prayed for good weather, and the Lord decided he'd bless us with it. Thank him so much for it. I want to welcome all of you. We're going to open the service with a word of prayer. Let's pray together, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the weather today, for your goodness and your love that you show to us continually, Lord. Lord, we don't deserve any of it. And you, you shower us with blessings over and over again, Lord, because you do love your children. Lord, I thank you so much for the people who are here. I pray that you would be with the people who aren't able to make it to our outdoor service, Lord. I pray that you would be with them, with, whether you have health conditions. I think of the people who are still sick, Lord. I pray that you would give them the strength to get better, Lord, soon so that they can be able to worship with us in person. We thank you so much for the strength that you give us every single day. And Lord, I pray that today we could show our love to you for the many things that you have given to us. Lord, may today be a gift to you. 
as we sing these songs and we remember about how great of a God you are and how wonderful of a savior you are, Lord, that we would truly show our love to you today through our actions and through our voices and through our hearts as we turn them to your word. I pray that you'd be with Pastor. Give him the strength and the words to say as you lead and direct in his life, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Brother Paul's gonna come with our next song. You may be seated. <laughs> well, I'll be singing hymn number 502 on the inside of your uh, music sheet. My Savior, first of all. We'll sing the first, second, and last, please. Go ahead and grab your Bibles, if you would, please, for our scripture reading this morning. Go ahead and turn them to Philippians chapter 2. Pastor asked me to read from the text that he'll be preaching from this morning, Philippians chapter 2. We're just going to read the first few verses there of Philippians chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. Paul writes, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort or love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Well, he said the text that we just read there is the text that Pastor is going to be preaching from. And the title of his message is, The Mind Most Precious. I'm going to ask the piano to, be, to play through one verse of his song. And as 
uh, uh, Sister Cherry does play through that song, I want us to pray and prepare our hearts for the message that we may be receptive to what the word has to teach us this morning and that we may have the mind most precious. If you take your hymn sheet, we look at hymn number 195, Look and Live, on the back side. We'll sing the first and last verse, please. <clears throat> Can you all hear me okay? Good. And you'll really hear me when I really get going. Amen. Sister Pat, it is so good to see you. You just surprised me. I looked up and saw you here. We've been praying for Pastor Brian. He just recently had another surgery and I found that out at the golf outing, which that's Pastor Brian, right? Never complains, anything like that. Love you, so glad you're here today with us. I had to smile at the back row Baptists hiding in the trees back there. Praise the Lord for the two trees in back, boy. We'd be in trouble if we didn't have those. I think if we took all of these, it's the same number as the people underneath the trees back there. Y'all made me happy back there. If your Bible isn't open, would you please reopen it to Philippians chapter 2? I hope you come today with a humble heart with a teachable spirit that says, I want to walk with God. But it's something I have to learn how to do. You see, the assumption is that people don't walk with God because they don't want to. But I think it's more than that. I think it takes a tremendous amount of effort to walk with God, which is why so few people ever really truly walk with God like David did, a man after God's own heart. And so I wanted to point something out to you. I had mentioned this passage um, last week in passing, and I went back and reread it. Uh, as part of my own personal study, I got stuck in it. And I had to share with you what God had reminded me of, the importance of the mind. Uh, I'm going to show you Philippians chapter 2 again, maybe open up your perspective a little bit to see how significant of a statement this is, that the mind is a terrible thing to waste. But before I do, I wanted to give you all just a couple quick updates. I uh, texted with Carol Retzler this morning. Her husband is not doing well. He has gotten much worse. They've decided that the bleeding that's in his brain, which it's difficult to tell with imaging until they really get in there, 
Um, but they've been doing constant imaging. They determined that that bleed is too deep into the tissue for any surgery. He has gone into full coma and uh, he now has pneumonia in his lungs. And the one thing that she texted was not even her son knows for sure if he ever accepted Jesus. So I wanted to let you all know the last time I saw him when he was in the hospital, went and saw him, got really close to his ear and reminded him that all he has to do is cry out and repent. And I told Carol, that's gonna be our hope for the time being because it doesn't look like he's gonna be waking up. So you please pray for Carol and for his salvation. You know, none of us really know what it's like to be in that position. Maybe he's talking to God the whole time. I don't know. Uh, but I know that he's heard the gospel and you all have shown it to him. So thank you. Just keep praying for Carol. This is a very difficult time. And of course, COVID complicates everything when it comes to seeing someone in the hospital. I uh, wanted to give you an update on Bob Drob. Uh, I told him to stay home. He was still maybe flirting with the idea. And I'm like, no, you need to stay home. So they've put him back in the neck brace and the swelling and damage to that tissue is uh, significant enough that they believe the only solution is surgery. So please be praying for him. He doesn't want it. He said that he has spent a couple decades trying to stay off of that surgical table over his neck and his back. And so for him, it's disappointing to think that that's gonna happen. So you pray for him and then keep praying for Ev. She's had vertigo for months and that has not gone away. She is still dealing with it. Um, in fact, the thought of walking on the uneven ground kind of made her uncomfortable. And so I encourage them, you guys stay home. You can watch it when it's online and that's what they're gonna be doing. So you keep praying for them. Bob is gonna see uh, a couple different people before he makes any decisions on that surgery. And so just pray for wisdom there and that the Lord connects him with the right people. And then an update on Tom. If you're wondering how he's doing, this past week, they trialed him off of the ventilator for 49 minutes, and he was able to sustain for 49 minutes before they needed to restart him up. That's hugely significant. That's a stepping stone. That's a platform to start working. And so they said, every day, we're gonna trial you off of the ventilator. There's other medications that his body has become dependent on that they're gonna start working him off of. It's gonna be a long process. But what lifted my heart with the newest update is that his doctors have become very optimistic about his recovery. Uh, it's gonna be a long process. We need to keep supporting Holly and Tom with prayer and gifts. And so for the entire month of June, we may even extend that into July a little bit. If you have a gift you wanna give and you're here, just mark it and drop it in the box that it is for them. You can also do it with an online giving, just mark other on the online giving. We'll know exactly what that's for. And we'll make sure that your gift gets to the Breen's um, for our guests that are here, we have a couple of you that probably don't know the situation, don't know Tom. They started coming to our church this last spring. And when Tom got sick with COVID, I was texting with him. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story because I fully expect that God's going to let him tell that whole story. But I will tell you this. He accepted Christ before he went unconscious with uh, his COVID infection. And he let me know that he had repented and that his life was in Christ's hands. And so we're thankful for his salvation. Keep praying for him. Their target and their goal, both Holly and Tom, is they wanna see him baptized. So you be praying about that, okay? Philippians chapter two. I want you to imagine what the church would be like, dare I even say the country, what the country would be like if this passage took us over, if we actually started thinking the way Jesus thinks, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies fulfill ye my joy, that you be like-minded having the same love, being of one, of, uh, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I hope that you're benefiting from that death today. Thinking about how hot it was last week, we are talking about how hot it could be this week, and concerned that some people might not come because it's outside. And on the way here, I told Cherry, I wonder how hot it was the day that Jesus died on the cross. Isn't it amazing how in love we are with our comfort, benefiting from the absolute lack of comfort that Jesus, Jesus experienced in his last moments of life? And how easily it is to become disconnected from what he did for us. When Tom was in the hospital, I had sent him a verse encouraging him and he answered back and said, this, this breathing mask is so uncomfortable with like four or five exclamation points after it. And then he said, after, after he made that statement, this breathing mask is so uncomfortable. Then he said right after that in a brand new paragraph in the same text message, but I think about how uncomfortable the crown of thorns must have been. When we're close to the gospel, we lose all entitlements. And frankly stated, we're just not close enough to the gospel. And so what's the secret? Let this mind be in you. And don't you wonder, what does that mean? Let this mind be in you. Uh, I was looking for statistics on mental health, and this was the one that I think kind of caught me the most. It's from John Hopkins University of School of Medicine. John Hopkins is a huge name in medicine. And according to them, 26% of Americans age 18 and older, which is about one in four adults, suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder in a single given year. One in four. I thought about making one in four stand up right now. I'll leave you seated. But do you get the picture? One in four have a mental disorder. Do you know that the highest listed disability in the United States of America is mental disease? Uh, Cherry was called to jury duty a couple years ago. And the single most prominent reason that the, that the seated jurors gave for wanting to be dismissed was that they had anxiety about being there. There was a girl that had, it was so obvious, her anxiety was so bad, the judge actually said, we're gonna go ahead and dismiss you. You have a serious issue. You don't have to be here. And that girl, Cherry said, was maybe 20 years old, maybe. And that of the people that said they had anxiety disorders, it was almost all young people that said that. One of my deacons sent this text, and I want you to see this. Or, uh, forward, I'm sorry, it wasn't a text. He forwarded me an email. Can you all still hear me okay, or did the sound go away? It's probably go. I felt myself yelling more. This thing just shut off. I'm going to blame it on myself because I'm bad with technology. I'm really glad not to have to yell now. I could feel it. I was like, I got to reach you guys. So it's having to be louder. Um, One of our deacons sent this a little too hot there. Just a little bit. It's, um, It's an email that Chipotle sent out to all of its customers in their email list. And in a big, fancy, billboard-style logo, it says, Chipotle Drag Lunch, featuring Trixie Mattel, Kim Chi, and Got Mick. Sunday, Sunday, 6.13. Uh, 6.15, I can't tell. They used a fancy logo. 15, I guess? I don't know, whatever it is. So is today the 13th? Well, if you guys all want to go to the drag luncheon at Chipotle, it's happening today. It starts at 11 this morning. 
They're calling it the celebration of pride, and the email has a running clock that says, get ready to party. Chipotle, a burrito place. If you buy the Trixie Mattel Pride Burrito, a dollar of every purchase will be donated to the Trans Lifeline. Chipotle, a burrito place. And it's got a picture of a man in drag getup. If you order the Kimchi Pride Bowl, the purchase donation will be a dollar to the Human Rights Campaign, which is a gay pride organization. And then Gottmik Pride Salad, a dollar to GLAD, which is a gay support organization. Then they go on to talk about themselves. For more than two decades, Chipotle has proudly celebrated the LGBTQIA plus community. I don't know what all of those are anymore. We received a 100 score on the Human Rights Campaign Foundation Corporate uh, Equality Index. We're proud to be an equal opportunity employer with zero tolerance policy on discrimination. We formed P-R-I-D-E, Pride, a resource group dedicated to representing and supporting our LGBTQIA plus employees. Recognized as a best employer for diversity of 2020 by Forbes, and a best company for diversity and company culture by, compar uh, uh, by comparably. Guess it's an organization. This got me, we offer benefits for adoptive parents, same-sex couples. Paternity leave as well as covered care for surgical services for transgender employees. So if you wanna disagree with the way that God make you and, and have a surgery to do at Chipotle, I'll help pay for it. A burrito restaurant. The mind is a terrible thing to waste. But what an awful, what an awful thing to think that however it is that you're made must be changed for you to accept and for everyone else to accept you. That's crazy, it's sad. What is a guy like me covered in white spots supposed to do? Really, what am I supposed to do? There's no organization that gives you your skin pigment back. Oh, they're whipping out surgeries to change your gender, never mind your DNA. The code writer will always know who you really are. What has happened to our minds? And by the way, this is now being celebrated as righteousness. People are being confused and victimized by our evil culture. And do you know who holds the line on mental health? It isn't psychologists, scientists, and universities. It's you who know the truth of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that I may be covered in white spots, but do you wanna know how I know that that's okay? Because covered in white spots and drenched in sin, Jesus Christ died and gave his life for me. And others may find me to have no value because of whatever it is I have going on. Be it my hairstyle, my height, or my weight, or the sound of my voice, but I will always know that Jesus gave his life for me and no one can ever take that away. And so here is this call for you to maintain truth in your mind. And I don't think we even understand how we work. And so today I'd like to show you the interaction between the heart and the mind and the resources found in God's word, the specific instruction that'll help us understand how do I rescue a troubled mind? And so we're gonna do it simply in three steps because a Baptist preacher doesn't know how else to do it. First, we're gonna define the mind. Then we're gonna talk about the dangers of the mind and then how you can have a disciplined mind. So let's go ahead and define it first. I need you to go over to Psalm chapter one. And I'm moving, by the way, there's, if you are truly someone that digs deeper, see me afterward, I'm skipping a lot of texts just to keep things moving. Um, but let, let's just dive right into what the definition of the mind is from Scripture. Go to Psalm chapter 1. It 
Psalm chapter number one, if you're watching online, get your Bible open. Look there as well. Now I want you to take Psalm one, put your finger in it. If you're swiping, this is your great disadvantage. Do you know how to use back on your phone? Go over to Matthew chapter 12, and I'm gonna show you this connection that helps us understand the definition of the mind. Matthew chapter 12, is the audio still okay? This is, this is good? Good, no need to yell. Matthew chapter 12, this is what Jesus says in verse 34. Oh, generation of vipers. I don't think he's being flattering. How can ye being evil? Now let's just stop, look up here and think about this for a second. Almighty God becomes flesh and has to live in the world and he sees the sin all over the place. Is it a wonder to us that the, that the, the purging of the temple that Jesus did, that, it, that that happened? Is it a wonder to us that it did? What's a wonder to me is that he didn't do that every Saturday. All of this sin, but, but what's worse is, is the pain that that sin causes for the creator who loves his creation. Lucas has in his room three turtles. He had, I think it was six goldfish. He could give you the name of all of them. We're down to three. Lukey, do you have three goldfish left? Oh, I'm sorry. He's got two goldfish left. Lucas, what are their names of the ones that are left? Samson and Dickon are the two goldfish left. You say, what happened to the others? I don't know if you know this or not, but turtles like goldfish as snacks. We'd actually put the fish in there to begin with so that the turtles would be healthy, but they didn't eat all of them. Apparently, they're little turtle farmers. They're waiting for their crop to get plump before they harvest them. He's had those two fish over a year. He knows them, and you know what? He had six precious fish that survived, and when Fivel would eat each one, he would cry over them. He'd literally cry. He'd come up and he'd be like, it's gone, it's gone. I'm like, well, maybe the goldfish rapture happened, right? Oh man, thank you. That'd have been a short sermon. Thank you, Adam. Last week's sermon was sponsored by Seth. This week's is sponsored by his dad, Adam. If my boy has a love for his goldfish, can you imagine what pain Jesus experienced seeing the ravaged world what sin had done to the world, how much that must have hurt his heart all the time. Those of you that God has allowed to raise kids, how hard is it when harm is caused to your children? What would you do? This is the pain that he experiences. And so he says, oh, generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we say the problem with, with sin and the problem with evil is the heart. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 22 that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. But then he goes on to say this, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Connecting the heart and the mind. And so then we go to Psalm chapter 1 to see the role that the mind plays. Psalm 1 verse 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he, do you see that word? Meditate, that's the exercise of the mind. How often do you meditate? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Godliness is accessed through the discipline of the mind. You say, what is the mind? If the heart is the resource center for raw material, the factory 
is what develops that material and makes something out of it. It's not an earth-shattering statement. That is to say, the heart and the mind can be conflicting. I stopped at the, uh, the grocery store. Asparagus is in season. By the way, you may want to look in the ditches down there. Uh, asparagus grows wild in our ditch right here along the property. Some of the biggest asparagus that I've seen. Brother Ron will grow it and share it from his backyard with us on occasion, but with their health, I haven't gotten my normal steady flow of asparagus. And so I was gonna surprise Cherry. I stopped and got asparagus at Kroger. And I threw it on the grill and went in the garage, got distracted and Cherry came out. The meat's all done and she says, is the asparagus done? You guys, I had left that asparagus on medium heat on my grill for over a half hour. Yeah, it's done. I had handpicked the prettiest, longest stalks of asparagus there at the store, right? I wanted the very best I could find for her. You can take great ingredients and ruin them. That is to say, just because you're born again doesn't mean your mind no longer matters. You can take awesome ingredients and make a horrible meal with it through your mind. That's why it's possible, as the Apostle Paul describes in Romans chapter 7, to be carnally minded. He said, I struggle, I have this choice in my mind, this condition in my heart, and I need a new nature. You know, a day is coming where there won't be conflicting reports between the heart and the mind. Doesn't it make you hungry to be in heaven? To not have to worry about failing. Be with the master and treat him perfect every single day. It's the greatest goal. But in the meantime, my mind is a danger and so is my heart. My heart is a resource. That is to say, if your relationship with God isn't right, your mind is guaranteed a mess because you can't take any garbage ingredients and make a good meal. We used to watch cooking shows on PBS. You guys ever do that? Makes you hungry. It's a terrible diet. Like, oh, just watch somebody else eat. No, terrible diet plan. So is watching weight loss shows. That's a terrible diet plan too. You'll eat during those as well. And every chef says the same thing. Start with good ingredients. Have you asked Jesus to save you? Has he given you a new heart? Are you born again? You say, yes, I'm good, I'm set, everything must be perfect from now on. How's your mind? What are you doing with it? What are you taking in? And so let me transition from the definition of the mind to the dangers of the mind. Because scripture lets us know just how dangerous a mind actually is. And it hurts to watch, it hurts to see. Go to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they call evil good and they call good evil. And they will fiercely fight and defend and maintain that definition. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, that is their mind, they were aware of him, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. That is, their mind knew, but their heart wasn't committed. Neither were thankful, but became then vain in their imaginations. And so the heart is lost over an infected mind. Does this start to trouble you at all if you're not confident that your mind is where it ought to be? 
that all of the greatest falls of mankind have occurred because we didn't guard our heart and our mind at the same time. And the simple fact is, we're not even guarding our hearts, let alone our minds. And so because they knew not God, they glorified him not, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves." who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever and ever, amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did like, uh, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The mind is absolutely dangerous. Number one, found in Romans chapter one, vile affections. Go to First Timothy chapter six. When I was in Bible college, they did this mock church split. And in this mock church split, the, the professor turned the class over to a guy who just mediates splintering, disintegrating churches. It's what he does for a living. And he stood up and said, what you're going to see is not a show, it's a reality. Although we have asked staff here at the college to play certain parts, everything that you're going to hear, I have personally witnessed inside more than one church assembly. He went on and they started this like full business meeting where there's a guy in charge and it's the, medi the, the mediator, he's the moderator for the meeting. And he says, there has been a question over the fitness of the pastor and so there is a call for confidence. And they asked one of the faculty members and his wife, they brought his wife in, they sat there in full Sunday clothes at this, at this class that I'm in, that's teaching us how to do a business meeting. And, and they're sitting at the front of the class and his wife is just sobbing. And we're thinking, man, this is the best performance we have ever seen. People would stand up and they would start yelling. They'd be like, he's unfit. Why is he unfit? Because we think he should buy a new boss. It's like there's this massive argument going on. And they're in these groups and they raise up and they start yelling. And it's like pure chaos. And in the end, by the way, we did a vote of confidence with all of the students. And the students affirmed that the pastor should be the pastor. Like the students are going to just fix everything. And in mass, as was scripted by this guy that set the whole thing up, all of the staff stood up and walked out the back yelling as they went. And the only people left were the students. And he said, that's what a church split is like. He changed his tone and became really soft. And then he reached out and said, some of you may have been noticing how hard this has been on our pretend pastor and pretend pastor's wife. But what you don't know is that's why they're at Maranatha. They had a church attack them. Not because of integrity, but because of preference over decisions. And he ended up at Maranatha and she was crying because she was having to relive it again. Some of you have been in situations where you've experienced the violence of a mad, of a mad assembly. And so this is what Timothy says, describing that anger that sometimes is seen in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, he uses this, perverse disputings. That's a good phrase to use. That's a very good description. 
perverse disputings of men. Why? Because of corrupt minds. How dangerous is the mind? Romans chapter one, it'll lead you to vile affection. Some of you are participating in garbage stuff because of the stuff you're listening to and looking at and more importantly, thinking about. But what's worse is you can't isolate it. You're gonna lash out at other people. Corrupt minds do that. They just do. You can see it in our current culture that corrupt minds get very, very, very angry. And so then number three, we're close to it. Go to 2 Timothy chapter three. I'll show you the last danger of the mind. And it's sad, but if we're going in progression, this is the worst, like this is the, this is the bottom. So we go from vile affections to aggressive behavior toward one another, toward this final, which is absolute anti-truth and anti-gospel, a hatred for God and for the role that Jesus is supposed to play by redeeming mankind. Second Timothy chapter three, verse eight says, now as Janus and Jambres, you know who they are, right? Janus and Jambres are the magicians of Pharaoh that stood against Moses when Moses was trying to reveal God's power and say, let my people go. And they reproduced, you remember, they, they came up and they had their own snake, but then Moses' snake ate theirs. That's Janus and Jambres. They are literally the right hand of Pharaoh. And this is what it says. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, literally anti-gospel, the mind is dangerous. When I was in high school, um, in our youth group, one of our guys, uh, we got a call, be praying for him. He's been in an injury. He's, uh, he's got to have surgery. He's lost a lot of blood. We're like, what has happened? And finally, we heard this story and we got to see him. He had his hand was wrapped up in this huge club. He had been visiting on someone else's property. I can't tell you why. I have no clue. But they had a bear in a cage there, like one of those chain link fence, nice and high and tall. And it had a high lid on it. And it was like a pet bear that they were keeping. And he had gone over to the cage because they had said, oh, it's, you got to come see this. He's got this pet bear. Well, the owner was with them, but he hadn't really given them the full, hey, this is what you can do and can't do. And the bear came up to him all happy, licking his nose and acting all cute like Pooh Bear. And my friend from our youth group in church growing up reached into the cage and went like this. Come here, little buddy. He said he just got done saying, come here, wiggling his finger. And before he knew it, that wiggle turned into nothing but a nub. He had like three surgeries. They took his finger and they sewed it down into his hand because that bear so cleanly ripped the flesh off that they had to work on rebuilding the flesh in his palm. So he had multiple surgeries. And I can remember how jumpy and terrified he was for years after that about going anywhere where there might be a bear in the wild. And we used to, you know, eventually he had nothing but his nub. And we would, you know, we'd poke at him and stuff like, hey, Eric, where's your nub? And he'd be like, right here, you know, number one. And he'd, he'd hold up his nub, it's all he had. And I remember him saying, how stupid, it! Why, why would I stick my finger in a bear cage? And so here you hear the pastor warning you that a reprobate mind, a mind that isn't guarded, be it saved or unsaved, will take you to vile affections. When we started the church, before we even uh, bought our current building, we used $10,000 to buy our current building from another church plant. This pastor reached out to me, really sweethearted guy. And he called me up and he said, come and, uh, come and meet me for lunch. I, I have something for you. He said, okay, never met him before. So I met this preacher, lived way up to the north, got together with him for lunch. And he presented me with a $10,000 check. And he said, we're dissolving our ministry. And he began crying. And I said, well, before we go cash in this thing, are you sure that's necessary? And he goes, it's absolutely necessary. He began to tell me about the size of the church and the makeup of the families. He had young families. He had some middle-aged families, but it was a young assembly that God had brought together. There's about 30 people. They were enthusiastic and excited. But then the discussion about being a deacon came up. And he not only realized that he didn't have a single qualified guy, but that they were in complete 
disagreement over looking at inappropriate stuff on the internet. And his men concluded that you can look and not touch and that it's not nearly as bad. And he pulls out Matthew chapter five and says, but what about this? What about lusting? And he said, pastor, I realized we weren't the assembled righteous bride of Christ. And so I'm disseminating the funds into God's work where they really belong. And he's just weeping while he's doing it. Some of you sit here hoping I'll touch on this topic and then move on really fast. Or, or please don't say anything about music because I know this stuff I'm hearing is wretched, horrible stuff that no vessel of the Holy Spirit should be listening to. But, but don't dive into it, please. It'll make me uncomfortable. Then know this, a uncontrolled mind, an unfiltered mind, an unprotected mind, a careless mind is as silly and stupid as living in the world as sticking a finger in a bear cage and thinking nothing is going to happen to you. You'll end up not only with vile affections, but mistreating God's precious people. And then ultimately opposing the gospel with your behavior. Your mind is a terrible thing to waste. You say, okay, so then how do I have a disciplined mind? What, what do I do? We go from the mind defined, the mind dangerous, to the mind disciplined. Three steps. Isaiah 26. I'll never forget um, one of the family traditions for the Fishers when the boys were little, which they're not anymore, but you guys were at one point. I can tell you, I have pictures to prove it. Um, and they were basically one of our you know, primary families with kids that age, so they got lots of attention, which was awesome. But they were allowed to invite one guest over for their birthday, that, that they, could, they could invite somebody. And uh, Caleb, who's traveling right now, sharing alpacas across the country, keep praying for his safety, uh, he usually chose pastor. And he'd always ask if pastor could come over for his birthday, dinner, and celebration. And so one year, I bought him this little, like, what else do you buy for a boy that's turning 12? A gun. I bought him this little plastic BB gun. It shot little plastic BBs. And so pastor has given him this dangerous weapon. And so we're gonna make sure that everything is okay. I'm gonna teach these boys, this is how you use this thing. I don't, Jason, Pastor Matt, do you guys remember when I came over and gave him those little guns? I don't know if you remembered or not, but um, I was showing Caleb, I was like, okay, so this is where you put the little plastic BBs in and here's the, oh, okay, yeah, I got it. So you put them in here and then you put it in the handle. Okay, got it. And then you take this and you pull it back. Now I've been through hunter safety. I'll never forget the most effective thing that they did was they brought a guy in whose face had been shot by a shotgun, who his, his whole face had like a, a deformity to it and scars. And because we had been talking about firearm safety and no one was listening. And then this guy walks in the side door and everybody started listening. And so I had been through that class as a 13 year old kid. Like I knew gun safety, never point a gun at anybody, toy or otherwise. And I'm showing Caleb, this is how it works. I said, so if you want to load one up to shoot it, you pull it back. And as I pulled it back, my hand slipped and the BB bounced right off his glasses. And I just took the thing and just handed it over to him like, you'll be safer without my help. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Know this, there is not a single person here that can afford to have an unguarded, undisciplined mind. Not a single person. And that includes me as well, of course. You must have a disciplined mind. And step number one is found in Isaiah. Uh, let me make sure I say it right. Isaiah 26. I'll give you these three texts. And it's probably not even earth shattering. I actually said it last week. I just wonder if anybody did it. And so maybe this week will be the difference maker. Uh, Isaiah 26 verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Uh, this was a verse when I was dealing with that steroid and all of those feelings. 
and I just kept repeating this verse to myself. It's one that Cherry gave me, was Isaiah 26, verse three. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. It is literally the absence of fear. And so here it is, step number one, stop. Just stop thinking about stuff you shouldn't. Boy, these notes just, they don't want to stay. Stop thinking about the stuff that you shouldn't be. What if we considered every Facebook post to be a verse? You hear me? Every Twitter is a verse. It's the verse of the humanism Bible. Every Instagram and Snapchat connection. Every Google image is a verse from the humanism Bible. Can I ask you a question? Are you one for one between God's holy word and the humanism Bible? Could you imagine if you forced yourself to earn your Facebook time and read God's word and said, okay, I read 27 verses of scripture this morning, so now I can look at 27 Facebook posts. How long does it take to get through 27 Facebook posts? Two minutes? I call it thumbing it. That's what we've called it in our house with Cherry. It's like thumbing it. So I'm not, I don't have an account on Facebook, but she does, and I have access to it. That might startle some of you to know, yes, pastor sees a lot of your Facebook posts. You should know that. You should know that. But more troubling, God does. You know what I mean? And sometimes I'm surprised what I see on there. And I told Cherry just this last week, thinking about this message, like, man, thumbing it just is, it's no good for your soul. You're spending all of your time taking it. Just stop. Stop with the garbage music. Stop looking at that stuff. Now, you know that if you stop, that doesn't just work, does it? If you've ever tried it. I remember I preached a message in my youth one time, and I said, I'm done sinning. Who's with me? And everyone, amen. We should have had a confessional service on Monday for all the sin we had done after I said we were done sinning. Of course, the purpose was let's live with resolve, but you can't just simply stop. It just doesn't work. And so we transition from stopping to switching. Number one, stop. Number two, switch. Go to Romans chapter 12. Verse 1 in Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by, does this surprise you to see? The renewing of your mind, that as you become less worldly, God does it through your mind. So stop looking at stuff you shouldn't and start switching. You say, well, how do I switch? Number three, Simple, study. Uh, let me give you a verse for that. Philippians chapter four. Now, as you're turning to Philippians chapter four, let me remind you of Philippians chapter two. This stuff is deep, awesome, and it all comes together. I don't know if they would brag about this in a theology book, but just know that you're going deep if you could stay with me right now. This is stuff that would take an entire 200 page book to describe that God's going to give you in a matter of moments as part of this church family. I really do believe that. Philippians chapter 2 says this Let this mind. You don't have to be an English professor or Greek philosopher or linguist to understand the difference between passive and aggressive, do you? Pastor Matt, come here real quick. Come here. Are we in frame here? Just come right here. This is, for sake of illustration, this is 
utterly disturbing, but it works really well, and don't worry, we're not going to actually have you hit me. I want you to imagine Pastor Matt makes a fist. Go ahead and make your club fist. I love that fist. This is my muscle right here. This guy does so much to help me, like constantly. I was telling Brother Bob, he's like, yeah, you know, if I could get a little bit of help, I'm like, I know who I can bring. I'm no good, but I know who I can bring. I got my muscle. Every once in a while, I'll tell, tell him, put the Fisher power behind it. That means tighten it all the way down. Get it secured. Make a fist. I want you to imagine that he punches me. And we'll go right here, which is a horrible idea. He's not going to actually do it because then he'd be looking for a new job. But if he did, and he punched me right here, question, who's doing the acting? Who's doing the receiving? Acting. Who's doing the acting? Who's doing the receiving? Okay, so watch this. Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you. Who's doing the receiving in Philippians chapter 2? And by the way, that, this is the description of Jesus who becomes man, finds himself in flesh, and then climbs onto the cross and dies. That's the language that's used. All of the language from Jesus' perspective is active. So let this mind... Who is doing the receiving in Philippians chapter 2? Say it. Me. Child of God, say it. Me. Brother Ray, me. I love this guy. So then who's doing the giving? I'm not even asking you to do something. I'm just asking you to open up your heart and mind and watch what God will do. Who flooded the world? Who saved humanity? Did Noah do any of that? Did Noah work? Yeah, Noah worked. But did Noah purge the world and save humanity? No. God did all of it. All he had to do was listen. Just do what I told you to do. I'll take care of you you stay obedient, and we'll change the world. Now stay with me. Let. You say, okay, how do I? Thanks, bud. Philippians chapter 4. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Now watch this. The God of peace shall be with you. Hold on to that phrase. We're almost done. Stay with me. Let this mind get in the word of God. Study the things of Christ. Think on him. Know him. Invest your mind in him as much and more as you are in the world around you. How many senses has God given you? I don't know. It's been a long time since I was in school. Five. And what is the connection of your senses to your mind? They connect you intellectually to the world around you physically. Do you see that? You have five senses bombarding your mind constantly about the things of the world five and you really have probably two when it comes to the things of the Lord Jesus your ears and your eyes and so Paul says work at taking in godly things you know I hear some of you you listen to other uh, brother Mark he'll share with me hey I heard this guy preach this sermon uh, Sister Connie sent me a, a sermon of a guy that I listened to in my childhood. You say, I'm not sure if I should listen to anybody else preaching. It's kind of like cheating on pastor. You realize I preach once a week and you have seven days to work with? Listen to more preaching. Get in the word. Read books. Read God's word. Saturate yourself with the Bible because here's what happens. All you do is take in. Just take it in. That's all he says. Philippians chapter 4. Take in godly things. And here's what happens. All of your character changes. Not because you did it, but because God's Holy Spirit changed you completely with truth. Now, what happens? 
the God of peace shall be with you. You say, what does that mean? I'm not just talking about your feelings. I'm talking about other people's security. Do you know that the reason why Tom Breen accepted Jesus Christ was because he came to a church that's focused on the gospel and a pastor started sending him scripture? That's why Tom accepted Jesus, because the peace that I had was the peace that he wanted. He texted me back when I told him that I was concerned for him and praying and not to be afraid. And he texted back and said, it's just like your sermon on Sunday. Death is dead. The last sermon he heard me preach before getting sick. Death is dead dead. Some of you have people that you love that have reprobate minds. You say, what do I do? Get in the word. Let God change you. They won't be able to resist it because the peace of God himself goes everywhere you go. And when someone isn't in peace, they will want that peace. You have to be patient to let God take them to that place where they want it. But you live out the gospel and know this. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world, which also means that he that is in them is weaker than he that is in you. They may be of their children, the devil, but you are of your father, God Almighty. And not just of him, but literally living him out in your body by studying his word. So my question is, how much scripture did you memorize this last week? How many verses? You say, oh, well, you should have talked about it last week. Go back and watch, I did. I did. I told you, start memorizing scripture. Did you? Well, I was really busy, right? You know what you're busy? Taking in all the things around you and not Philippians chapter four, verse eight, think on these things. You've been warned. Mess with this stuff. Your relationships will disintegrate and you'll become an enemy of the gospel. That is to say, people will go to hell because of your behavior. They'll see you and they'll say, that's, I don't want anything that's there. Just keep being careless with your mind. Keep sticking your fingers into that bear cage. Don't be careful with your mind, and I guarantee you destruction. It's guaranteed. Here's what's most frustrating. I have people sitting here listening to me right now that will be in tears in my office over unspeakable pain and suffering, over sins and failures, because you didn't listen. I'm begging you, be careful with your mind. It's a terrible thing to waste. Because if you'll give your mind over to Christ, he'll have your heart. If he has both of those, his peace will pour into the world through you. And is it possible that you and I just might still yet see revival in this country? This chaotic, messed up, confused, hurt, insecure country? Absolutely, because the gospel is just simply that good. And it starts with you studying the Bible. You can't live without it, Christian. And so would you make a commitment today? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Jesus, we have been here in this yard seeking to worship you. And I ask the question, have we worshiped you? We've sung, sung songs. People have brought gifts to give. All good worship have sacrificed their time and their mind. But our hearts have yet to be sacrificed. And so here it is, Father. If we're going to worship you not just on Sunday... The first day of the week, but serving you, worshiping you every single day, then commitments need to be made today. And I pray that you'll give us the courage and the awareness to stop, switch, and study. Lord, may you be glorified by this invitation. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We're going to give you a chance to respond. No need to stand up. Stay right in your chairs. My wife is over at the piano. And in a moment, she's going to play a song and give you a chance to talk to the Lord. But it's simple, two things. If you're going to switch, you have to name what you've been taken in, that you're no longer going to, because this is personal between you and God. I'm no longer going to take this stuff in, and I'm going to switch my perspective. Is there room for you to grow when it comes to the way that you're disciplining your mind? Would you talk to God about that today? And if you're here, and you've never asked Jesus to save you, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you have sin in your life that you know is there and you say, I need that new heart you were talking about, cry out and ask God to give it to you because Jesus died so you could have it. Right here on this lawn that God provided for our church family, you can pray and ask him to save you. You can become a child of God through his grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. 
that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I hope you'll take some time to pray as the piano begins to play. as we have named specific areas of our life that need to change. We pray for the steadfastness of your spirit to hold us to the decisions that we have made. No man changes without the constant work of the Holy Spirit in us. Father, if there is anybody that's here that hasn't asked to be saved, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. And Lord, I ask for mercy on their life if they did not ask to be saved. That, Father, they wouldn't go into eternity this week through an accident or an illness, but that you would keep them alive by your mercy and your grace. For, Father, if they have not accepted you and they die, Father, they will face judgment. They cannot be forgiven. So, Lord, please reach the heart if it hasn't been reached yet. And to all of your precious children that have made those decisions, they are big, and Satan is not okay with it. And so I pray that we would work hard, starting even tonight or tomorrow, that families would begin naming a verse to memorize and sharing it with each other and keeping one another accountable, that friends would share scripture with each other, and more importantly, we would see the master in everything, because in seeing the master in everything, you will change us into his mighty servants that are changing the world. Help us to love you, and not just say that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, in just a moment, we're going to go ahead and dismiss you. Huge thank you. You all came into the property awesome again, preferring one another, taking care of each other. Thank you. It's stressful not knowing how it's all going to go, but you guys have made it a beautiful process. You really have. If you're wondering, how long are we going to do this? As much as we can. It's great. It's good. It's fun. It's safe. There will be days where it's too hot. And our building is just too small to pack everybody in. We kind of proved that. We weren't sure. I don't need politicians or even physicians anymore saying what needs to be done. We know what happened, and that's okay. We found the edge, and God took care of us. And so we're going to function knowing what happened in that building. It's just a very difficult building to meet in. But we've got some special events planned that might involve a big, huge tent and some guest speakers. So you'll be praying for us with all the details that are going to be coming there are quite a few folks that aren't able to come because of the allergies, and that's a seasonal thing. So even as you're praying for the church family, I hope you pray for the service as it's coming. You know, praying for the church service to be awesome and for God to use the preaching. I hope you pray for those allergy sufferers, you know. It's not easy for them not to be able to come. Even Brother Paul said, if I get into a sneezing fit, I won't be able to finish the song. So Pastor Matt was literally ready to jump in and finish a song if his allergies took over. So people are dealing with it and we know that. If people aren't able to be here, we're not condemning anybody. Post the services online. Wanted to let you all know that my family is going to head to Wisconsin. When I was hospitalized with COVID, I scared a lot of people that care a lot about us. Uh, probably mostly our parents, Cherries and my own. And they've been, we were supposed to go at the end of April and I got sick. And so they've been asking, when are you going to come and so I've put together a very special opportunity to show some love to Cherry's brother. This is going to be the first Father's Day where Cherry's dad isn't with us, but is with Jesus. And so it's good for the family to be together. And I've got a chance to make it a very special one for Caleb. Um, Cherry's brother, really my own brother too. He's a brother in my heart. And so we're going to be in Wisconsin for Father's Day. That's hard. Pastor Matt, I asked him, will you please preach Father's Day and know that I'm not, like, that's tough for me. I'm sharing Father's Day with him. He goes, Pastor, this is the third Father's Day in a row I get to preach. I was like, well, apparently we've made a tradition here. I don't know how that's happened. But we're going to be leaving Wednesday and coming back on Wednesday, Lord willing. We appreciate your prayers for safety. Pastor Matt will preach, and then when I come back, 
Dads, I'll have a Father's Day message for you and the gift. So it's Father's Day with your family next Sunday. Pastor Matt probably has a Father's Day message he's working on. But we will celebrate Father's Day when I get back. I've got a special gift. I say I. I get the credit for this gift that Rebecca and Cherry are fervently, diligently working and making. And it's a good one, so you'll want to come, all right? Thank you. That takes care of everything. Be good to each other. You are dismissed.